When I told them that I wanted an attorney before I gave them any samples, I told them that in the beginning, and, and when I told them that, they, they shipped me off and moved me to LaGrange. But they brought me back uh, three or four days later, and they wanted me to talk to someone. They wanted me to talk to an attorney. You know, they finally, just three or four days later, and just so happened it was Howard Jenkins. And, and I knew that Howard Jenkins, he's, I didn't think that he was an attorney that could handle this type of case. And, and I told him, I said, well, I'll talk to him. I don't know about having him represent me, but I'll see what's, see what's up. Well, they took me out in the hallway with him, and uh, just me and him, and then first thing he told me, he said, uh, he said, right now I want to tell you something. He said, I respect you then, and I respect you now. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, he said, Bastrop is trying to cover their ass. What he meant by that, I don't know. To this day, I still don't know, but, well, I got an, got an idea, you know, that they are covering their asses, but... <clears throat> On August 3rd, 1996, a little over three months after the Stacey Stites murder, Bastrop police investigator Ed Samella died due to a suspicious gunshot wound to the head. Ed Samella had been part of the Stacey Stites murder investigation. He was one of the first people on the scene of the abandoned pickup truck where he collected the initial evidence and afterwards he accompanied Jimmy Fennell to the wrecker where the truck had been towed so they could examine it together. Two weeks prior to his death, Ed Samella resigned from the Bastrop Police Department and surrendered his guns. Officer Paul Alexander, in an unrecorded interview, told this reporter that he himself confiscated two handguns from Samella prior to his resignation. The local newspaper reported that before his resignation, Samella had been indicted for making terroristic threats to an ex-girlfriend, which was cited as the cause for his forced resignation. The indictment and the incident that caused it have not been verified. The investigation on my brother's death, I do not believe was handled correctly. The Bastrop Police Department came in, understand, and went to the scene and decided that it was one of their ex-police officers or police officers. Therefore, they backed out and called in the Texas Rangers. And by the, the lead investigator on that was a, a man by the name of Rocky Wardlow. Now, I don't know if anybody else knows, but Rocky Wardlow had been going through a divorce uh, a few months earlier and was actually a roommate of my brother. He needed a place to stay. Therefore, I felt Rocky Wardlow should have stepped back as the lead investigator on that instead of going forward with it. I believe that was handled all incorrectly. The only remaining report on Ed Samella's death comes from Rocky Wardlow himself, who assigned himself the lead investigator on the case. In this report, he claims that he was called to the scene by Bastrop police officer David Board. David Board had advised Wardlow that he was on the scene of an apparent suicide at a local Bastrop apartment complex. Scott Samella, Ed's brother, had an opportunity to speak with the neighbor who last saw Ed alive, heard the gunshot, and called police. As he relayed here, in this 2015 documentary released by A&E Television. The neighbor across from me, he said, your brother walked into his apartment. I went back into mine to get some more boxes. He said, I heard a shot. He said, I came out immediately, knocked on his door and hollered for him and nobody answered. He said, I turned the doorknob, it was locked. So he said, I went back in and I called dispatch. He said, I went, opened the door, and there were already three police officers standing at your brother's door, and the door hadn't been kicked open. This account directly contradicts with Rocky Wardlow's report, which states the neighbor waited 15 minutes to call police and omits any information on how police gained access to the apartment. It also makes no mention of the fact that neighbors checked the door and found it locked. Though Wardlow writes that Samella was personally known to him he never reveals in his report or in his trial testimony that he had in fact lived with Samella and at one point he had a key to the same apartment where the shooting took place. A glaring omission of fact and a serious conflict of interest. Wardlow's report and testimony indicate he determined that the death was caused by suicide due to a letter he discovered written by Ed Samella's ex-girlfriend found on the scene and a subsequent interview with that same girlfriend who reportedly told Wardlow that Samella had been calling her repeatedly over the past few days. 
the letter referred to in this report has never been provided to the Samela family, nor was it ever made available to Reed's defense for verification. And the reported phone messages were erased. I had to do the cleanup after my brother's alleged suicide. The couch was removed from my brother's apartment. They said it was too unsightly for us to see. Um, I got a call from the um, laundromat where there's a young lady who folds clothes, washes them and folds them for you by the pound. Said that my brother dropped some clothes off down there. I went down to pick them up and said that he had arrived at the dry cleaners or at that cleaners, it's about seven o'clock, 6.30 to seven o'clock. Dropped them off and said that he would be back in an hour to pick them up because he was going back to Louisiana uh, to see a girl and do a little more gambling because he still had vacation time. And I guess at this time, um, he knew it had already been fired, but he was getting paid out on vacation. So he was gonna go back there and, and just kind of live it up a little bit. And approximately an hour later, he went to a pulse machine there at the, the bank and had made three transactions for $600, which is $200 per transaction. That money and those, those transaction slips were still sitting in his console of his truck. Approximately 30 minutes later, the man's dead. None of this information was included in Rocky Wardlow's investigative report. What was included raises serious questions regarding Wardlow's conclusion of suicide, including the fact that Samela was shot on the left side of his head. Uh, my brother's being shot with the left hand is bogus. My brother couldn't do anything with his left hand. He shook too bad. My brother was right-handed. Another disturbing detail of Wardlow's report and testimony is the fact that Ranger Wardlow did not do a gunpowder residue test on the victim at the scene. When asked why he didn't during testimony in Reed's trial, Wardlow claimed his kit was in his other car at his residence. Yet maps show Ed Samela's apartment was a mere three minute drive to the Bastrop Police Department where kits were available. Yet no requests were made by Wardlow for responding officers to bring a gunpowder residue kit for testing on Samela. Later, autopsy reports show that hand wipes were taken at the autopsy, but toxicology reports do not indicate that any hand wipe results were recorded. Nevertheless, Wardlow testified during Reed's trial that the hand wipe results from the autopsy were negative. I mean, the evidence is laying there. I do not believe they investigated anything or they would have found the laundry, the money slips. They, they you know, when an officer or so-called, a, a soon dismissed officer, I believe should have been investigated a lot more. I think they investigate a, a, a regular homicide more than they, what they would have done my brothers because they came to a conclusion the minute they walked in the door. Wardlow testified during Rodney Reed's trial that he took a vial of Ed Samella's blood to the Department of Public Safety lab for testing for comparison in the Stacy Stites murder investigation. Records indicate that this blood was submitted on August 12, 1996, nine days after Ed Samella's death. Seven months later, on March 13, 1997, with the Stacy Stites murder still unsolved and just over two weeks before Rodney Reed would be arrested and charged with the murder, Rocky Wardlow requested that the blood of David Hall, Jimmy Fennell's neighbor and fellow Giddings police officer, also be submitted for comparison in the Stacy Stites murder investigation. The Texas DPS lab report by Wilson Young indicates that neither Ed Samella nor David Hall's DNA were found to match any foreign DNA left on the victim, Stacy Stites. Yet David Hall and Ed Samella were both named in a Texas Department of Public Safety lab report that didn't surface until two years after Rodney Reed was convicted as possible contributors to DNA found on two beer cans recovered from the location where the victim's body was found. Rodney Reed and his defense claim they were never provided this critical information at his trial. I feel that Lisa Tanner from the Attorney General's office, I feel that she put that off in there to make it look like we had knowledge of it. We didn't, we didn't have no knowledge of it at all. My habeas attorney, Bill Barber, she called uh, Lisa to the stand. She said she doesn't recall giving it to my defense, but if she didn't give it to us, her investigator gave it to us. 
Okay, so then we called her investigator, Missy Wolf, on the stand. And we asked her, did she recall giving it to my defense? And she said, well, she didn't recall giving it, but if she didn't, Lisa gave it. So both of them are saying that they, neither one of them, they're saying they don't recall giving it. And I'm like this, if neither one of them recall giving something that critical, you know, something that important, then they didn't give it. However, District Judge Harold Towsley, the same judge that had presided over Reed's original trial, where he had denied a defense continuance to adequately prepare for the trial and dismissed key witnesses on Reed's behalf from testifying, including his alibi and witnesses that could have confirmed he and Stacy's relationship, ultimately ruled against Reed in his post-conviction appeal and issued his opinion that the suppressed DNA evidence would not have changed the jury's verdict. Nevertheless, serious questions remain about the motivation of Rocky Ward Lowe in collecting the blood of Ed Samella and David Hall, considering he ruled both of them out as suspects and specifically testified that David Hall had an alibi, that he was home asleep with his wife, Carla Hall. I've gotten, you know, these, these letters that came out in the paper on DNA, you know, testing a beer can and it having uh, David Hall and Ed Samla's DNA on it. I know everybody's heard that. Number one is I want to know what two police officers are doing drinking out of the same beer can. That, you know, could, to me, that's, that's just absurd. Uh, I feel, I'm not sure, but I feel that could have been placed on the scene for further, if someone got out of line. The use of DNA as a deterrent or a decoy in the Stacy Stites murder case could only have been done by state officials in possession of the evidence thereby making it extremely difficult to prove. Yet insight into the intimidating practices of the prosecutors in this case are evident in an exchange between Lisa Tanner and Carla Hall, who was a friend and nearby neighbor of Stacy Stites and was married at the time to David Hall, whose DNA was identified on one of the beer cans. I can't recall the year. Had to be between 2001 and 2005. But uh, I was on a phone call with Lisa Tanner, and I was questioning it. And, you know, I was concerned with the DNA that was found on the beer cans and what that would lead to because of who they said the DNA had belonged to. I just worried about it. And she had made the comment to me, well, you do know that there was a female DNA found on it, and it wasn't Stacy's, then it could be yours. Well, no, I don't drink beer, so I, I kind of started laying low after that comment. That was when I started leaning toward, wait a minute, something's not right here. Mm -hmm. And I never had any other contact with the Texas Attorney General after that comment was made. It came across as a threat, but then I went back and, yeah, it did. It came back as a threat for me to be quiet. What other intimidating or deceptive practices were engaged in by Lisa Tanner and Rocky Wardlow in the arrest and conviction of Rodney Reed? And to what lengths did each go to secure a death sentence of a man whose science now proves is wholly innocent? And what knowledge did Ed Samella have concerning the Stacy Stites murder investigation that could have put him in danger? I remember uh, there was a time where Stacy, she would come with, with marijuana. And I was wondering where was she getting all this marijuana? And I remember her telling me, Edward. She said, Edward. And I only, I know Ed Samella as, by Ed. You know, when you mention Ed, you say his name, Ed. Everyone know who you're talking about, Ed Samella, which he was uh, over narcotics, you know, the narcotics division down in Bastrop. Um, and when she said Edward, I was, I was thinking several other people that I know by that name. And it, it didn't, didn't dawn on me that it was him until it came back that he was one of the suspects. And then it, I started thinking, well, maybe he was giving her the drugs to come to me and possibly and then, so that they can say they had me on videotape. They never had me on videotape. The person that they had in videotape was not me. I believe my brother got into something and found out way too much. 
is my feeling on my brother's case. And he was actually sitting back trying to figure out how to go and resolve this and ended up not being in this world anymore. I believe he had some information that was incriminating to maybe some other officers, maybe not in that county or in another county, that actually led to his death. Yes. Myself, I don't believe they have the correct person in prison over the Stacy Stipes murder. And I do believe that if they find out or if it's found out that somebody else had killed Stacy Stipes, they'll find out in my mind who killed my brother. Texas Ranger Rocky Wardlow, the lead investigator in the Rodney Reed case, who failed to search the apartment that the victim, Stacy Stites, was last seen alive and that she shared with her boyfriend, the main suspect and former Giddings police officer, Jimmy Fennell. Rocky Wardlow, who returned Jimmy Fennell's pickup truck where the victim's body had been kept back to Jimmy Fennell, who was a suspect at the time, just three days after the murder, irrevocably losing key evidence and depriving Rodney Reed and his lawyers an opportunity to verify the condition or the contents of the truck or conduct any independent forensic testing on the vehicle from which the state alleges the victim was abducted. And Rocky Wardlow, who failed to do a basic investigation of a suspicious death of investigator Ed Samella, a former roommate of his, a fact that he omits in his written report and in his testimony during Rodney Reed's trial. Lisa Tanner, lead prosecutor of the Rodney Reed case from the Texas State Attorney General's Office, who appears to have suppressed critical DNA evidence in this case and intimidated witnesses with the power and influence of her office. And Rodney Reed, 21 years on Texas death row, and now weeks away from a state-sponsored execution. An execution by a state who has systematically failed Rodney Reed on every level. An execution that must be stayed immediately, given the evidence which any honest person can clearly see.